Welcome all. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, I'm Evan Graves, Program Manager here at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music. Um, and we are very happy to have you with us for our final installment in our webinar series, Historical Studies in Christian Liturgies. In case you don't know, the ISM is an interdisciplinary graduate center here at Yale dedicated to the study and practice of sacred music, worship, and the related arts. Um, you can learn more about our program at yale.ism.edu. I hope you have been able to attend some of the previous talks in this series, but if not, know that you can find previous lectures on the Yale ISM's YouTube page. And I think you'll see we've had quite an amazing roster of speakers throughout the year. Um, in addition to welcome, welcome you all here, I want to offer a warm welcome to today's speaker, Professor Gabriel Radel. Um, who will be introduced in just a minute. Um, but first, I wanted to let you know that we're going to have some time for questions and answers after the talk. Um, and you can answer any, uh, enter any questions you might have using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And you can even put those in during the lecture um, as you like. So with that, I will pass this over to Professor Vasily Marinas, um, Professor of Christian Art and Architecture here at the ISM to introduce today's speaker. My pleasure to introduce uh, Professor uh, Radel. Gabriel Radel is the Reverend John O'Brien Assistant Professor of Liturgical Studies at the University of Notre Dame. He specializes in early and medieval Christian liturgy. His work investigates the historical practice of Christianity through the comparative reading of liturgical texts across traditions, and by engaging these sources with visual and material culture, hagiography, homiletic literature, and legal documents, both canonical and civil. His publications include studies on early Christian and medieval marriage rituals in East and West, Greek manuscripts of prayer books, the development of Eucharistic formularies, liturgical posture in early and medieval Christianity, and life cycle liturgies for children and adolescents. Professor Radel has a remarkable publication record, including four edited volumes and several peer-reviewed articles in such distinguished periodicals as the Bolatino de la Badia Greca di Crota Ferrata, Orientalia Christiana Periodica, and Speculum. He has lectured internationally and held research fellowships at the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale, Dumbarton Oaks, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Princeton University, the University of Regensburg as an Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Fellow, and the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where he is currently a member of the school in the School of Historical Studies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Radel virtually to Yale. Thank you, Vasilis, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Can I just get a thumbs up or a verbal OK that you can see that? Yes. Great. Across societies, key moments of the human life course, such as birth, puberty, or death, are commemorated ritually. Anthropology describes these moments as rites of passage. That is to say, these rites accompany an individual through changes in their identity as they transition from one state of life to another. In many cultures, specific rites of passage mark different moments of childhood and the transition to adulthood at adolescence. Ethnographers have traced such rites of passage in diverse societies. For example, among peoples as geographically spread as the Fulani of West Africa and the Tufi of Papua New Guinea, it is common to ritualize a young girl's passage into womanhood through a rite of facial tattooing. While the Mawe people of the Amazon are known for a coming of age ritual performed with boys whereby one must prove entry into manhood through a several hour long ritual dance performed while wearing gloves filled with biting poisonous ants. Closer to home, here in the United States, many of us are familiar with the quinceanera rite, within especially Mexican-American communities, but also other Latinx communities. While such rites of passage are celebrated events within the societies that practice them, anthropology also characterizes these rites as life crisis rituals. <clears throat> 
these rights perform a rupture of a person's previous identity and remove them from a previous social category, accompanying them through a liminal state and then launching them into an entirely new identity with a completely new set of social expectations. These life crisis rituals not only celebrate a passage in the life course, but they serve as social instruments to guide an individual and those around them as they navigate between one identity and another. Anthropological work on rites of passage has proven useful to liturgical scholars reflecting on Christian sacramental practice, most especially when discussing the multi-stage process of Christian initiation within those church communities that practice revived forms of the adult catechumenate. However, unbeknownst to many today, including scholars, is just how germane the topic of rites of passage is to the study of Christian communities in late antiquity and the Middle Ages. Liturgical manuscripts of East and West preserve the texts of liturgical blessings connected to specific moments in the human life cycle that are tied to stages of childhood and adolescent development. These rites largely fell out of use in the Middle Ages and did not make it into early modern printed liturgical books and by extension, liturgical practice. Thus, seldom have scholars of liturgy paid extensive attention to them. This is not entirely surprising since as a field, 20th century liturgiology largely marched to the beat of ecclesial and liturgical renewal. And the idea of languishing time to unravel the history of rituals that no longer characterize the religious activity of contemporary Christians appeared to be of little use when the history of sacraments like baptism and the Eucharist needed to be written. And we might add in many cases, especially with regard to the Christian East, still need to be written or in the case of the West, uh, nuanced. At the same time, from our own vantage point, we may deduce that only a broader panorama of the contents of liturgical manuscripts can provide us with a deeper insight into how liturgy functioned, what it meant, and what it accomplished for late antique and medieval Christian societies. Today's talk aims to help do that by drawing attention to the lost life cycle liturgies for children and adolescents found within manuscript sources representative of Christian practices from late antiquity and the early Middle Ages. Rites of passage were common to the ancient Mediterranean world into which Christianity arrived in the first century. Ancient Greek, Roman, and Jewish societies alike knew of various life cycle rituals, some performed as civic ceremonies, others as private domestic activities, and still others as part of public religion. I argue that it was such transitional moments of the human life course that were carried into Christian communities as formal religious rites adapted to the tenets of the Christian faith and frequently officiated by clergy. When these rites of passage were performed as part of Christian liturgy, they had the potential to take on heightened religious significance since the texts they employed provide a social definition that linked an individual's life to participation in divine life. When liturgy punctuated key moments of the human life course, it presented these transitional events as new opportunities for the soul's progression through the sanctifying action of God. Childhood and adolescent rites of passage are found in some of the earliest liturgical manuscripts of both Eastern and Western traditions. While I, while I will refer to some of the early medieval Latin examples of these prayers, my focus today will be on the Eastern Roman Mediterranean world. This is not only because the Christian East was home to the majority of Christians in the world in late antiquity, but also because it is Eastern liturgical manuscripts, especially Greek ones, that conserve a greater number of rites of passage when compared to the Latin sources. These rites can be found in copies of the Ephologion, that is the liturgical book used by bishops and priests for presiding over liturgical services and formal blessings. So what are these rites of passage in the sources? Six specific liturgical blessings can be found in early Ephologia manuscripts for the following occasions. A rite for naming a child on the eighth day, presenting a child at the church for the first time on the 40th day, a rare prayer for when a child begins to walk, a child's first haircut, a rite for a man's first shave, and a rite for a young woman binding up her hair and adopting a head covering. We should note, however, that no single early ephologion contains all six of these, 
So for example, the oldest Greek priestly prayer book, the famous Barberini Codex from Southern Italy, which we'll talk about in a little bit, includes five out of the six, while the second oldest epilogian we have uh, from Palestine, which came to light in the new finds, contains three, although admittedly this book uh, is missing several dozen folios and might have originally contained more. I should first remark that I am excluding one liturgical rite highly associated with infancy, and that's baptism. This is because baptism is not strictly tied to stages of human biological development, even if the rite became associated with infancy already in late antiquity, a topic that deserves an entire talk unto itself. On the contrary, Byzantines and other Christians continue to use the baptismal rite for adult converts, we have many examples of this, sometimes accompanying territorial expansions uh, of the Eastern Roman Empire. And the rite of baptism itself is entirely about the incorporation of an individual, irrespective of age, into the ecclesial body of Christ. In fact, even long after the rite had become predominantly associated with infancy in the Eastern Mediterranean, the textual forms remain those for the adult catechumenate. So because the rite is not by definition connected to biological development, we save it for treatment elsewhere. Returning to this list of childhood and adolescent rites that appears in the oldest liturgical manuscripts, you may notice that two of them parallel Jewish practices attested in the Hebrew Bible's Book of Leviticus. Circumcision on the eighth day, which is also when a Jewish male child traditionally received his name. Here it is replaced by naming alone. And the other is the presentation at the temple of Jerusalem on the 40th day, in the case of a male child, or on the 80th day uh, for a female child in terms of rites connected also with the mother's purification. Here, uh, replaced by presentation at the church building, and 40 days applied equally to both genders, uh, unlike in Leviticus. Half of the rites, however, involve hair in one way or another. We may relate this to an anthropological principle. Hair is the only prominent feature of the human body that is at the same time capable of painless amputation, manipulation, and regeneration. Because hair can be painlessly manipulated, it takes on an important role within the ritual techniques of identity construction across different cultural traditions. Within Christianity, the most famous example is monastic tonsure. But the early liturgical manuscripts reveal that late antique societies use hair broadly for rituals beyond monasticism. Rites for a child's first haircut show up among the prayers in the oldest Eastern and Western liturgical books, such as this prayer in the eighth century Jalon Sacramentary from Gaul. Across the different versions of this rite, it is clear either from the titles or the prayers themselves that they are intended to be recited over children upon their first haircut. Given that these rites appear across the Mediterranean, and in the oldest extant books, I would argue that the custom was likely developing already in late antiquity within the context of the Christianization of the Roman world. Although there are not extensive classical descriptions of the custom, we do have some late Roman non-Christian references to the act of offering up a first lock of hair at temples as a type of first fruit offering. While in ancient Egypt, there was a specific rite known as the Malokuria the public cutting of a youth's lock of hair as a coming of age ceremony. In fact, papyri remains of Oxyrhynchus include late antique invitations that parents sent out for people to attend such hair cutting ceremonies. Such various pre-Christian traditions are doubtless in the cultural background at the time that these liturgical rites for children's haircuts are being formed. The continued importance of haircuts within the ritual construction of identity can even be seen played out within contemporary Orthodox Judaism, where we find the parallel of the Upsherin ceremony conducted at the age of three. While ethnographers have likewise documented local family rites for a child's first haircut among Greek and Slavic communities of Southeastern Europe, where they're performed, but without the involvement of clergy. In short, while the life cycle liturgical rites of late antiquity and the early Middle Ages have their own contexts, they participate in a much broader phenomenon. On the screen before you, I provide a translation of one of the oldest versions of a liturgical blessing for a first haircut. 
found in the Barberini Ephologion copied in the eighth century in Southern Italy. As you can see, the specific rite is composed of two prayers, one presumably recited before the haircut and the other after. We can go ahead and, and read it. We supplicate you, Lord God of our salvation, who blessed this child from the plenitude of the baptismal font of your goodness. Now may your blessing descend upon his head, and as you bless David through the hands of your prophet, likewise bless this child through the hand of me, a sinner, sending upon him your Holy Spirit, and with the first cutting of the hair, grant him to grow unto a full age and gray elderhood, to see the prosperity of Jerusalem all of his days, and be pleased with the good works that you have arranged for us to put into practice, for unto you is due praise, glory, and every adoration. Then second prayer after the haircut, Holy Trinity, our God, bless this child with every spiritual blessing and grant unto the parents, your servants, that protected by your mercy, the child may live unharmed and without disturbances to grow intelligent and to successfully carry out every good work through the prayers of the Theotokos and of our Virgin Mary and of all your saints. The text makes it clear that the child had already previously been baptized it is also noteworthy that the text makes anamnesis of David's anointing. Scripture does not mention a specific age for David at the time of his anointing, but Byzantine imagery typically envisions him as a boy. The first prayer beseeches God not only to bless this new life stage, but also to accompany the child's future growth, that he or she might attain a full age and even grow to elder years of grayness before finally, in eschatological language, being enabled to see the prosperity of Jerusalem. The prayers are concerned with the child's own healthy physical maturation, while at the same time orienting that maturation toward virtue, that is, to quote the second prayer, to, quote, carry out every good work, end quote. This is one of several different texts that circulated in early manuscripts for a child's first haircut. And the variety of texts and their appearance across various traditions, I believe, testifies to the popularity of this rite. In the West, rites for a child's first haircut died out, but in the Eastern Mediterranean, where they are plentiful in the sources, the rite did not entirely vanish, but rather was eventually incorporated into the end of the baptismal rite. However, in this context, it's lost much of its meaning. The early manuscripts are unambiguous that it was originally performed as its own independent rite of passage. Here in the Barberini Ephologion, for example, the prayer is found about 140 folios away from the baptismal rite. And it is surrounded by other texts for various occasions, including other life cycle rituals. Beyond the manuscripts for uh, liturgical Ephologia, we have other sources that testify to the meaning and use of first haircuts. The Liber Pontificalis records a fascinating indication that Pope Benedict II in the seventh century received the hair that had been cut from two imperial children of Emperor Constantine IV at Constantinople. The idea of sharing the imperial family's body finds confirmation in the 10th century Byzantine manual of court protocol, De Ceremonies, where we read, that an imperial child's first haircut was performed by the patriarch in a chapel of the palace in the presence of the court and government officials. The court manual confirms what we find in the liturgical manuscripts, namely that the first haircut is completely different from the rite of baptism. De Ceremonius describes the rite within this Palatine context, where a series of handkerchiefs were stitched together in a chain, each held by a particular dignitary who had been pre-selected to receive some of the hair of the imperial child. After the patriarch had recited the text of the rite preserved in the liturgical manuscripts and cut a lock from the child's head, he placed the hair in the first handkerchief, apparently setting off a chain reaction, whereby the lock was passed from handkerchief to handkerchief, person to person, each one in turn retaining some of the hair strands for themselves before passing the lock to the next person in line. Thus, the rite also served as a way for the physical body of the imperial family to be distributed and reside with multiple imperial officials 
and in multiple places of the empire. That Pope Benedict was also sent portions of the imperial body in the seventh century is noteworthy since it was precisely this Pope who had managed to negotiate a certain degree of autonomy for the Church of Rome from Constantine IV at Constantinople, whereby a new Bishop of Rome would no longer have to wait for the emperor's personal approval, a process that could leave the city without a bishop for months, but instead could receive Episcopal approval directly from the imperial exarch at Ravenna. The sending of imperial hair to this Pope seems to have served as a ritual mechanism for bridging the geographic distance that had become a particularly vexing problem for the local church of Old Rome. Hare also features prominently at adolescent coming of age rituals across liturgical traditions. Early Greek and Latin manuscripts contain rites for a man's first shave. While many such texts are found in the earliest extant liturgical books, the texts are different, and these traditions likely developed independently from one another, alluding once again, I would argue, to the importance of these rites of passage for such societies prior to Christianity. The religious nature of a young man's first shave is affirmed in ancient Roman sources. For example, according to Suetonius, Emperor Nero performed his first shave accompanied by sacrifices and dedicated his first beard clippings on the Capitoline Hill, presumably at the Temple of Jupiter located there. Similarly, because comparative liturgy shows these rites uh, in different traditions of East and West, like the tradition of a first child's haircut, this suggests that barbatoria rituals were practiced by Christians well before the oldest surviving manuscripts, and that these rites too represent early attempts to Christianize a Mediterranean religious association with a young man's first shave. What is more, one of the oldest Latin prayer books, the Bobbio Missal, indicates that a man's first shave was not just performed over a domestic rite, but was viewed with such religious significance that it was performed within the church building itself. The earliest Greek version is found in the very oldest Byzantine Apologion, the aforementioned manuscript Barberini Greek 336. In my view, it's highly likely that this prayer was long established by the time it was copied in this eighth century source. And here you can find it translated, we can read it briefly. Lord God of powers, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in your economy chose us poor sinners in the service of the priesthood, so that through us, the faithful people might favorably adore your name. We pray you and supplicate you, our omnipotent Lord God. Bless the works of our hands, and as the blessing that descended upon the head of Aaron down to his beard, and as the dew of Hermon that descended upon the mountains of Zion, may your blessing descend upon the head of this your servant and upon his beard, for unto you is due all glory, honor, and worship. The brief text celebrates the man through priestly language. Um, and I find this particularly interesting. In, in several of these life cycle uh, rituals, we have uh, you know, self, a lot of self-referentiality on the part of the clergy, which is very interesting because we tend to talk about um, references to priestly unworthiness showing up uh, within the Eucharistic text. And we've tended to write uh, the history of clerical self-referentiality through Eucharistic texts but we see this process showing up earlier outside the genre of, of uh, Eucharistic text. So I think these, these rites of passage also offer us a lot of, of other room to think about other things, but we'll, we'll save that for another time. Um, not only is the priesthood of the presider of this rite commemorated, but the young man's shave is likened to Aaron's anointing, especially as refracted through Psalm 133. Uh, the choice of this Psalm in reference to Aaron's beard and the dew of Hermon was likely motivated by the fact that this psalm is one of the most recognizable biblical references to a beard, which must have been known to the composer of this text very well, um, given the frequency with which the psalms were, were memorized and, and widely known. But one might wonder whether the choice of this specific psalmic verse was also connected to the use of oil potentially within the shaving rite itself. Since we know that in, pre, in a pre-shaving cream world, various solutions, including the use of oil, could be used to lessen the pain of shaving. There is a rich history of beard symbolism, including within the church, as we recall that the presence or absence of beards is one of the things frequently mentioned in East-West Christian polemical literature. Furthermore, rituals of forced shaving or grabbing individuals by a beard appear throughout the late antique and medieval Latin and Greek record as modes of public humiliation, disciplining, 
or even humor. And time does not permit us to explore in detail here the interperformative web of meaning that this right for shaving is intersecting with. But one question deserves particular attention, and that is the ambiguous title of the prayer. It is clearly intended for doing something with a beard, in Greek, pogonos, but what is slightly ambiguous is the use of the Byzantine Greek verb, kurevo. The modern Greek word for barber stems from this same word, but the verb and its related substantive, kura, can have a variety of meanings, including shearing for sheep, cropping, clipping, or complete shaving. It is impossible to know with absolute certainty within a given context whether this prayer was used specifically for complete shaving or whether beard trimming might have been involved, and indeed variant customs may have existed. However, I believe that shaving is likely the original intent, which would correspond with pre-Christian Roman practices of celebrating a man's first complete shave. Given that this prayer shows up in the oldest Ephologia manuscripts, it is likely that it was first composed in late antiquity before Byzantine male fashion and cultural norms dictated beards for all adult non-eunuch men. For context, this process sets in around the early seventh century when we see imperial portraiture like that of Phocus and Heraclius before you on the Solidi uh, depicting beards, unlike previous depictions of emperors like the famous image of Justinian at Ravenna, which continued to showcase Roman clean shavenness. However, Later adaptations to the Barbatoria rite evidence a move away from associating with shaving and more toward general well-keeping of a young man's hair. I believe these shifts in later manuscripts come about precisely because of the earlier texts being associated with complete shaving and later scribes sought to adapt the rite to an increasingly re-Hellenized context in which complete shaving was culturally discouraged. The Ephologion Coilin 213, copied within an elite context at Constantinople in the early 11th century. This is our oldest Constantinopolitan uh, priestly prayer book to survive. Um, it includes a later redaction of the rite translated on the screen. Lord our God, you who brought forth all things from non-being into being as manifest tokens of your magnificent and have not only adorned man with your intelligent and rational image to varying degrees, but also beautified him with different types of hair. Uh, you who told us to do all things for your glory, thereby your servant now begins, what I would say, the habit of shaving or cutting the beard or hair of the head. Unlike the earlier prayer, the text here celebrates a man's beard as a sign of beauty, which one might interpret as a not so subtle defense of Byzantine fashion. It also connects a man's beard with his adornment by God with intelligence. That is to say, the beard signifies maturation, both physically and intellectually. But what is particularly noteworthy about the later prayer is that it slightly alters the general sense to make it a rite about a young man assuming responsibility for his general grooming habits. It becomes a rite about taking care of one's body for the glory of God, where the practice of cutting the hair can also serve as a replacement for complete shaving. If this male coming of age rite celebrates a young man for his intelligence, rationality, and glorification with priestly subtexts, the female counterpart to this ritual contains other accents. What I argue is the female coming of age ritual was a specific Byzantine rite for binding up and covering a young woman's hair after monarchy. Indeed, some of the manuscripts, including the oldest Constantinopolitan Ephologia, uh, include this rite immediately after the rite for blessing a man's first shave, showing that these are conceived even within the arrangement of the prayer books as, as related. The chart here before you lists the oldest Ephologian manuscripts that we know of that survive and which one of them contain this specific prayer indicating a broad geographic spread from Southern Italy to Palestine. Based on comparative liturgical tools for the analysis of liturgical manuscripts, which I won't rehearse for you here, I've recently argued that this text disseminated across much of the Mediterranean world from the Eastern Roman capital in late antiquity and may have even been composed at Constantinople. However, unlike the rites for a child's first haircut or a man's first shave, this ritual is peculiar insofar as it has no Western corollary within Latin liturgical manuscripts. 
The prayer makes a number of biblical allusions, the strongest of which is the famous passage from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, in which he admonishes women to offer prayer and prophecy with their heads covered. Of course, few Pauline passages have generated as much debate and scholarship. And if anyone is interested, I'm happy to talk more about this in the Q&A in terms of what's going on liturgically with this passage, both in the first century and beyond. But, but in short, the Pauline passage appears to be concerned with the Corinthian practice of women removing their normal head coverings in the Christian assembly as an affirmation of the equality of the sexes. And Paul's passage is not motivated by any apparent need for women to add veils as an exceptional prayer attire, as some authors today purport. And other early Christian authors from Tertullian to Chrysostom are emphatic not so much about veils in church, but about hair coverage as a general habit of dress for post-pubescent women within their cultural context. According to social norms of the time, the binding up and covering of hair was a symbol of sexual modesty. This goes back to ancient Hittite laws and Middle Assyrian laws about women's dress. And notions about the importance of female hair coverage likewise pass into early uh, Greek and Latin literature. These notions were performed and re-performed in numerous Christian hagiographical texts and visual representations and are affirmed by the prayer itself. While women's attire did liberalize, at least for the upper classes starting in the Augustan age, the social norm that women should have their hair bound up did not abate as evident across surveys of funerary imagery uh, of ancient Rome and other visual evidence. Furthermore, with the Christianization of the Mediterranean, we can note an increase in hair coverage with an aristocratic portraiture setting in around the fifth century. And some recent studies of late antique women's tombs in the Karga oasis of Egypt and elsewhere, likewise note frequent hair coverage of women within late antique pre-Islamic Egypt. There are also many works of Christian literature that help contextualize the meaning of this liturgical prayer. And we don't have time to go through all of them, but I'll offer one, and that's the life of St. Ioannikius from the ninth century. In it, we read about how a saint is healed, uh, a saint heals a woman who we are told was possessed by the spirit of fornication. Most interestingly, the text describes her as letting her hair hang loose. The loose hair is tied directly um, to her, her, what's described as her vice. Um, and this is an ancient symbolic notion that carries into the modern English expression, loose woman. Uh, in the Vita, when the saint, when the woman asks Saint Ioannikius to heal her, it is precisely through the image of binding. Lift from me the co heavy collar of fornication and bind me by your supplications with the bridle of self-control. The liturgical life for binding up and covering a woman's hair takes up this same idea and requests that the young woman's new dress habit might serve her in self-control. Like the other liturgical rites of passage, the manipulation of the body serves the construction of identity. Yet specific notions are underscored for this female coming of age ritual that give us insight into social concerns around gender difference in the late antique Christian Mediterranean world. There is a lot more that we could say about these childhood and adolescent rites, but that is just a little taste of one genre of text that you can find within early liturgical books, and which I believe opens up a range of opportunities for exploring issues relating to late antique religion, social structures, family, sexuality, and more. These specific rites also provoke reflection about how child and youth development could be conceived as a liturgical celebration and also the roles these liturgical blessings played for families in late antiquity. That these late antique liturgical rites represent a process of Christianizing previous ritual behavior finds an interesting modern analogy within Coptic liturgy of Egypt. Egyptian society knows of a unique ritual known as the Sebu. This rite performed on a child's seventh day from birth is largely officiated by women and includes such rituals as a baby's first bath, or a specific rite of a mother stepping over her child seven times. These rites bring a baby out of its first week in confinement, at which point it formally joins the kinship network and is publicly assigned its gender. First baths were ritually significant, 
significant across the Mediterranean world, as evident in medieval artistic imaginations about infancy scenes of past biblical characters. Furthermore, the archaic origins of the Sembua are implied by the simple fact that these rituals are performed within both Coptic, Christian, and Muslim families, with only the hymns and texts being different, but the gestures largely remaining the same. With the exception of a 1980s visual uh, anthropology study by Fadwa El Gindi, who documented the Sebua mainly within Muslim families of Egypt, there is virtually no Western scholarship on this tradition, especially within the Coptic Christian context, a topic I hope to explore in the future together with my Coptic student, Arsani Paul. But what is interesting for our discussion today is that within Coptic Christian communities, there has been a trend toward increasingly making the Sebua a formal liturgical rite officiated by a priest. Thus, while the Sebua likely goes back to late antiquity or even earlier, the fact that a process of liturgicalization of the custom is still ongoing represents an interesting window that could provide insight into the dynamics of the Christianization of similar rites of passage in the late antique Mediterranean. And the shifts in ritual agency and narrative that accompany the liturgicalization of such ceremonies. Such ethnographic reflection invites us to consider possible power dynamics at play within the late antique rites of passage between the priest and other actors involved in officiating these family rites. Comparative liturgy also reveals some of the anxieties that clergy may have had toward ritual behavior outside the control of the church and the circulation of superstition and or magical associations with these rites. A unique 11th century Latin liturgical book from Spain conserves a rite for a man's first shave, but then adds in the margins uh, anathema to those uh, who uh, drink the beard clippings as the heretics do. Evidently, a young man's first beard growth was associated with potential benefit to imbibers. We can only hypothesize what drinkers of beard clippings sought to gain, but given that these were the first visible signs of manhood, it is likely that they were associated with virility and may have been viewed as an aid toward fertility problems. This marginal note in the medieval Spanish manuscript suggests that the inclusion of rites of passage for childhood and adolescence within our earliest liturgical sources may also have, at least at times, been motivated by a desire to baptize, if you will, pre-existing Mediterranean ritual activity, including customs that were viewed as questionably orthodox, magical, or superstitious by church leaders. The meaning of the late antique Christian rites of passage is also tied up with what we might call the heavy weight and risks of childhood existence. Cecily Hennessy, building upon earlier work of Angeliki Layu and others, has argued that across late antiquity and Byzantium at any given moment in time, more than half the population would have been under the age of 20. This is not entirely surprising since we find similar statistics within a number of non-industrialized societies with low access to contemporary medicine. In the late antique and medieval Mediterranean, children and youth were everywhere and only a small percentage of the population was beyond what we would call today middle age. Childhood mortality before the age of five was high. So for people who lived long enough to become young adults and get married and have children of their own, the risks of burying one's own child were high. The arrival of a child at a milestone of human development was certainly something to celebrate. These rites give us precious access into how families both celebrated life and process anxieties around the human life course. And they likewise give us a unique window into specific liturgical experiences of what was actually the majority population of the Christian world, namely children and youth. Jesus may have said, let the children come to me, but our standard genre of texts that we liturgists use for writing early liturgical history such as church orders and early liturgical canons, seldom mention children unless it is to refer to them in passing as receiving the sacraments, general references for parents to raise their children well, or in the case of the fifth century Testamentum Domini, admonishing uh, about keeping disorderly children in line at church services. On the other hand, the liturgical manuscripts we have analyzed today attest to a pastoral sensitivity toward families and children that was likewise present within late antique Christian communities. 
Thus, we find within these rites yet another reminder that early Christian liturgical history cannot be written from the perspective of one source type alone. For those late antique Christians who had been sufficiently catechized, the church's liturgy was viewed as the place of the divine human encounter. While the existence of these rites may surprise many modern listeners, when we contextualize these rites within a liturgically centered community, the choice to bring these culturally significant steps of the human life course into the church's liturgical life was in many ways the obvious thing to do. The act of bringing a transitional moment of the human life course into the church's liturgical life provided a liturgical definition of the phases of human growth on this earth and oriented physical maturation towards spiritual growth. Anthropology refers to rites of passage as life crisis moments. And this is certainly true on the most fundamental of levels, since each transition represents a rupture from one's earlier identity and a move one step closer to the ultimate crisis of death. The late antique Christian communities that crafted these rites of passage took the volatile liminality of a given transition in an individual's human development and marked it out as a place for divine action to intervene, resolve the crisis, and guide the individual on their life path that leads toward the eschaton. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. It's uh, quite uh, fascinating uh, material. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. And I, I was wondering if I could ask uh, the first one, even though I think you um, sort of answered it already, but I was wondering if you could offer a little bit more concrete um, uh, uh, sort of answers to that. So you argued convincingly that these uh, are uh, these rituals are essentially Christianizing earlier practices and activities. Uh, uh, and it's perhaps because I spent too much time with Protestants here, but I, I would like to ask, is there any profound theological reason for the church to get involved into you know, somebody's first haircut or somebody's shave? Because you know the, the content of the prayers was sort of a little bit all over the place. Yes, you know there is Aaron's beard. Okay, uh, we found a parallel there. But is there anything more substantial? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's something that I've that I've uh, gone back and forth on. Um, there are times where I see a profundity in the church stepping in and doing these things, and there are times where it's just yeah, you notice. Okay, this is the most simplistic, uh, easiest prayer to compose for this specific rite, and something else is going on here. Um, I think one of the things that's really important is to realize that, that what we have surviving is this liturgical prayer um, or lit set of liturgical prayers in some cases for a given rite, um, but a lot more was going on. Uh, we have invitations, like I said, uh, of papyri, people inviting to attend their child's first haircut. These were important events. Um, they uh, were probably celebrated with feasts, um, gatherings, and in a certain way, this is not unlike what we see happening in the uh, Christianization process of marriage ritual, whereby you have pre-existing customs that the church is gradually coming in, stepping in, and, 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 and providing, let's say, um, uh, theological uh, definitions and substance too. What's interesting though, we also have evidence, at least in the case of marriage ritual for individuals themselves inviting the participation of clergy. Insofar as in ancient celebrations, you would have rhetors and others um, giving speeches for such family events. Uh, as families were becoming Christian, it becomes sort of uh, the natural thing to ask the, the, the clergyman to, to, to fill in that role. So I think that's also going on. Um, when I think about the meaning of these rites, uh, you know, to use uh, ethnographic analogy, you know, one thing that I, uh, you know, think about is in the United States, the quinceanera ceremony in which you have um, individuals who probably don't remember any of the actual texts that would have been recited over them. And yet, which coming from South Texas and knowing many people who've gone through a quinceanera, uh, people for whom that was a pivotal moment in their life uh, and recognizing a shift in, in their own identity. Um, I don't wanna to talk too long on this one question, give, a, give other uh, chances to talk, but a, a fun exercise I do when I'm teaching rites of passage is to ask students to write down when they first recognize themselves as an adult. Uh, 
And uh, then whoever wants to share can share. And I consistently have a massive, you know, huge variety of responses. Um, but when I have a student from South Texas or some other places, uh, I'll often get the quinceanera. Um, whereas other people give sort of responses of, well, I don't even know if I'm an adult or when I got my driver's license, maybe. Um, and so these, uh, these rights are, are doing something definitely within, within um, the social network of, of recognizing clear stages and shifts and transitions. Um, and I think the, the theological profundity can be found not so much, it can be found within the text, but it can also be found in what's going on in terms of redirecting what is already a really important a social moment and giving it um, a theological uh, twist, if you will. Um, so I think um, I think for some there was theological profundity. I think for others it was it was a minimal part of a bigger of a bigger thing. Yeah. Thank you. A uh, question from my colleague, uh, Professor Teresa Berger. Thank you for this fascinating presentation. My question, I think your work prompts an overall challenge for scholars of liturgy, namely to broaden our narrow understanding of what constitutes liturgy, in quotes, and liturgical practi practices to which scholars should attend. Yes? Uh, amen. <laughs> yes, I, 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 that is what I'm, what I'm suggesting. Uh, and I, I hinted at it in various ways in terms of um, uh, power dynamics and different types of agents. That's why I find this ethnographic analogy with the Sebua particularly interesting because we can see, uh, I don't want to use the word, maybe, maybe it's too strong a word, but competition between uh, ritual agents as clergy are stepping in um, to, to that uh, right. Um, as it's becoming liturgicalized, if you will. Um, but we even have echoes of that. You know, when we think, not to be anachronistic in using ethnographic analogy, but when we think about these dynamics as they're playing out within those societies that still practice, um, you know, deeply uh, rooted rites of passage, um, it gives us, let's say, uh, sensitivity to listen for echoes of similar phenomena within the sources. And one of those is in that rite for binding up a woman's hair because you might have noticed it, I, I didn't read the whole text, but in that rite, the priest prays not just for the woman, but he also commemorates and the one, and he uses a feminine form, the one, so the female person who is binding her hair up, which we might think of as a sort of sponsor. But if these rites are already being done in some capacity or another within some communities uh, prior to uh, the clergy's involvement, we might even think of that woman who's referred to in the background as uh, a ritual agent or efficient, um, who's now a co-efficient or sponsor uh, with the liturgicalization of the rite. Um, I think also what, what, what these rites do is they challenge us to think also about the, um, the penetration of liturgy into the domestic sphere. Um, it's hard to know exactly where all of these prayers are being done. We might think of them as domestic rites, but the Bobbio Missal gives us an example of a domestic shave actually happening in the church building, which I think testifies to um, how, how much these were getting liturgicalized. But, uh, but yeah, definitely uh, it, it challenge, these rites challenge us to, to think about how we define what is liturgy. Yeah. Thank you. We have uh, uh, just a few more minutes for uh, questions. Uh, I don't see one in the chat, so maybe I could ask one more. Do we have any, uh, you mentioned the life of San Ioannikios, do we have any evidence outside the Ecologia um, that refer to these uh, services being performed, rituals rather being performed? Yeah, that's a good question. So specifically with the right for uh, binding up uh, and covering one's hair, we do not. Um, and I've looked a lot. Uh, I have not been able to find any uh, external outside the liturgical books references to that liturgical right. Um, for the haircuts and the shaving we do, uh, we have um, pre-Christian references and then we have Christian references like the Liber Pontificalis referring to the Pope receiving hair uh, and things like that. So we also have in Gaul, uh, Merovingian uh, testimony, Itzhak Hen has written a little bit on that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we do find echoes for some of these other rites, but for that, that interesting rite for binding up and covering a woman's hair, um, I've not been able to find any references to the ritual outside um, of the, uh, the liturgical evidence itself. 
Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is because I argue that it is a late antique, right? And even by the time that the manuscripts, the extant manuscripts uh, start surviving, um, it's probably um, pretty old and gets um, used uh, in a decreasing amount. And I make arguments as to why that is, because I think um, the argument I make is that the right for veiling fell out of use because practices of veiling actually increased in the middle Byzantine period, um, precisely as that interpretation of Paul's letter to the Corinthians gets adapted. And in the middle ages, we see people using it as a reference to the need to add hair coverage in church, you had prepubescent women already wearing veils in churches by the middle Byzantine period. And that um, led to the decline of, of the rite itself because the veil was no longer a signifier of someone's attainment of maturation because prepubescent girls were now wearing veils uh, in, in the middle Byzantine period in ecclesiastical context. I see another question came in, should we? So, um... The question is, have you come across an Islamic ecologia containing the prayer for binding up and covering a woman's hair? Uh, yes, I have. Um, I treat this in, in an article I recently published in Speculum, and uh, you can check it out there. But it's very fascinating because in the Slavic context, this right for binding up a woman's hair is entirely repurposed. Um, and it's repurposed for um, consummation uh, contexts. Uh, in other words, uh, in the Slavic milieu, it was very common historically that veils signified marital status, um, like they do within contemporary Judaism. In fact, I argue that contemporary Jewish notions of head veiling are actually uh, probably an influence from um, Slavic customs because um, minority Jewish communities in Yemen and elsewhere preserve the ancient idea of veiling at puberty, which we still find within Islamic societies and which we find in Byzantine societies and elsewhere. Um, but back to your point, the Slavic uh, cultural notion of hair coverage or specific types of veils at marriage uh, was very strong. And uh, when this prayer passes into the Slavic context, by that point, Byzantines probably weren't performing it very much. And so scribes, uh, at least some in the Slavic context, repurposed it as a prayer, we have one manuscript that says, a priest recites this prayer for veiling a woman um, after her consummation. There's a, there's a specific right for that because the sexual transformation is what um, in the Slavic context, at least in some Slavic contexts, seems to have brought on a specific dress custom change. Thank you for the question. So last call for a quick question before we wrap this up. All right, um, well, I would like to uh, again express my gratitude to Professor Radel and to all of you for attending this uh, most interesting uh, talk. Um, Eben, is there uh, something to do? No, I was gonna just add my thanks for a fascinating talk and a wonderful discussion um, to all the audience who's been with us the whole year. Thanks for joining all of, this, uh, all of these talks in this fascinating series and just a reminder you can catch any talks you missed on the Yale ISM's YouTube page. Um, so with that, thank you again, Professor Radel. Thanks, Professor Marinos, for um, manning the Q&A. And until then, until the next time, stay well. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.